It is my tremendous honor to welcome you, our distinguished audience, and to collaborate with our expert panelists with the honor to chair this intriguing and most exciting virtual roundtable titled, titled The Greatest Generational Wealth Transfer in History is Now on behalf of the prestigious Harassus USA Conference 2022. The purpose of this virtual roundtable panel really is due to this uh, substantial flow of funds uh, and private wealth transfer occurring over the forthcoming generation from the baby boomers to the next generation inheritors in the USA and globally. However, there's often a, a lack of understanding of the key trends that will play a major role going forward, and particularly the values, interests, uh, and areas of focus the next generation may take. In the, in the USA alone, for example, as far as this wealth, tra wealth transfer is concerned, it's predicted 68 trillion will transition between now and 2060, which is a monumental amount of uh, funds. At the apex of this phenomenon are the 1% comprising the ultra high net worth and family office communities and their next, next generation inheritors. And, and these are often the most misunderstood category of investor because of the privacy uh, and uh, the lack of accessibility. A family office for those that are not aware possess investable assets of $100 million or more, and an ultra high net worth individual is uh, one that possesses $30 million in net worth or more, with many possessing obviously greater amounts than this. But just to, to, to provide a taste of the enormity of this wealth transfer, there's in excess of 10 trillion in assets amongst family offices loan, according to some studies. I would actually contend that there is substantially more than this that aren't necessarily con uh, considered a family office. WealthX, for example, stated uh, the combined global net worth is approximately 35.5 trillion amongst the entire global ultra high net worth community. 34% of family offices globally are engaged in sustainable investing, and it's even a bit higher in Asia with um, up to 40% in the Asia Pacific. And the forthcoming era of the virtual global citizen is, um, very, much, um, is very much upon us due to technological advancement and the growing interconnectedness of communities globally. Um, but now it's my pleasure to share with you the full description and topic of, of which this roundtable will be uh, focused. The greatest generational wealth transfer in history is now. The global community of millennial inheritors lead the tidal wave of generational wealth transfer, estimated at 68 trillion by 2060 in the new USA alone. But what are the values, vision, objectives of this more socially focused future 1% that are tech savvy, ESG conscious, um, more so than their elders? As the trajectory of economies continues to become digitally transformed, globalized and regulated, will the direction of this new breed of private wealth leaders galvanize a new order of positive social impact and greater wealth distribution? Now, let's uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. Firstly, David Dietz, who is the Global Director of Impact Initiatives from Nexus Global uh, USA. Welcome, David. Professor Bob Garrett, who is the Director of Good Governance Institute, uh, Good Governance Development Limited from the United Kingdom. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. Kyle Hong, who is the Founder and Managing Partner of Alcove Investment Management USA. Welcome. Thanks, Peter. And Sunny Hong, who is the Chief Investment Officer of Soho Global Fund, uh, Singapore and USA, and also part of a family office. Welcome, Sunny. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm Peter J.R. Aylwin, who is uh, uh, Director of the ATOS Group of Companies, uh, United Kingdom and Globally. Now, look, uh, what I'd really like to do is, uh, before, before we, we get into the detail of the discussion, uh, we're all very much intrigued to learn more about um, your background, your areas of focus, and what led to you becoming interested in and affiliated with the uh, Great Wall Transfer. Why don't we start with you, Sonny? Um, just in terms of my background, um, you know, I have 26 years of experience in technology. Uh, half my career is mostly in in industry, and the other half is mostly investing in technology. Um, so during my early years, I was, um, you know, working at AT Kearney doing market interest strategy for tech firms, started my own supply chain management company, um, and um, worked at Microsoft for a little while. 
uh, since then, I've been on Wall Street investing in a lot of these innovative technology companies. And um, from there, I think I've learned a lot about in terms of some of the different um, avenues where, especially in New York, there's a lot of innovative VC style type of foundations. And that's when I really got interested in, in, in funding and supporting a lot of these initiatives. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sonny. And Carl, same question. We'd love to hear a bit about, more about your background and how you got involved and interested in the Great Wealth Transfer. Sure. Um, so my background is uh, in technology and finance. Um, I started out uh, my early days as a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley many years ago, um, mostly investing globally throughout U.S. and emerging markets, uh, encompassing LATAM, MENA, and Southeast Asia to uh, really grow tech startups in uh, various domains from seed to 10 figure valuations. And uh, my general focus areas were uh, in the realms of big data and uh, enabling innovators to leapfrog towards Industry 4.0 and uh, building disruptive technologies from scratch with uh, zero legacy code. But um, what really got me affiliated with the great wealth transfer was uh, the shifting methodologies of how uh, newer generations were interacting with technology compared to the older generations. So uh, we've definitely been observing uh, this new phenomenon of uh, tech dependency, uh, where people are living and breathing in the digital world, uh, coping with information saturation, rapid advancements in physical technology, uh, which I think has uh, gradually led to this cultivation of uh, growing appetite for authenticity for this uh, first digitally native generation. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, David, same question. Yeah, so um, I'm, thank you for having me, or having us all, uh, Peter. It's really nice to be here. Um, so I, as you mentioned, I, I am the director of impact for Nexus, a network of the next gen sort of philanthropists, impact investors, and social entrepreneurs from some of the world's leading, leading uh, business families. And I got interested in this because I actually started at Nexus as a member um, and joined um, the team, the, the Nexus team, after selling my um, startups as an entrepreneur um, in the sustainable fashion space. Um, and I had a, the privilege of actually speaking at a Nexus summit, and I saw the power of community um, after I kind of realized I had an aha moment where I made more progress in uh, one month after this, this summit uh, when I had spoken um, than I probably had in six months prior from, from members coming up saying that they wanted to collaborate, to support, to advise um, looked to me for sort of advice as well. And I saw that as like the potential um, for um, the next generation who has sort of unique influence and access and resources. Um, if we can, you know, in, in educate, inspire and activate them, we have that, that ability to, to drive um, great change. Um, you know, we're right in the middle of, a, of seeing this great transfer of wealth, in particular with Nexus 2. Uh, when, when we started as a community, um, we were about... 10 years ago, our members were a bit younger, had a bit more hair um, and maybe a little less access to their family resources. But a decade on, we've, we've seen our, our members now step into this, uh, you know, really position of privilege um, where they can really affect great change in so many different areas. Um, and so for, for me, our work is to sort of make sure they have the tools and the knowledge um, to do good with those resources and what we like to say sort of hurry history. So. Um, I, I think there's a, this opportunity at this moment um, to really direct a, a huge amount of, of resources and capital um, to, you know, whether it's technologies or this philanthropy to causes that um, really can make the world a better place. Yeah. Thank you very much, David. And Bob, same question. Um, <clears throat> yes. You, with your introduction, you suddenly uh, made me think I'm actually just pre-baby boomer. Um, which was a slightly alarming thought. Uh, and uh, twice recently, once in Europe, once in Africa, I've been introduced with my wife, Sally, with whom I work, as living history, um, which really did make me think. Um, but uh, I had a, a non-career. Um, one of my PhD students says that in my case, career is a verb, not a noun. I just bounced around the world. Um, doing things, particularly large-scale organizational change. Um, and in doing that, uh, ran into all sorts of interesting people, usually at the top of their organizations, which included uh, a couple of the uh, leaders of the Communist Party of China at the end of the Cultural Revolution, various uh, leaders in the Gulf, 
uh, certainly in Southern Africa, um, and uh, recently in the Caribbean, as well as around Europe, but mainly not the European Union. Um, it's, um, it's been an interesting life uh, where I've been looking at the way in which people learn, particularly very top people learn, or often fail to learn, or, or rather learn the wrong things. And uh, in the end, this became uh, an area of interest called corporate governance. Um, so I was there before it was corporate governance, and I worked with Sir Adrian Cabri on making it into corporate governance. Um, but in doing all that, I've always been very interested, particularly in families and uh, family offices, on the incredibly tense atmospheres there are often amongst the family members there and in doing conflict resolution quite unofficially um, to help develop the businesses and to, to help um, develop their thinking, their strategic thinking about their future investments. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, it's great that we sort of gain a greater understanding with these very diverse backgrounds, but all uh, experts in, in your own um, affiliations with the Great Wealth Transfer. But now let's get to the, the heart of the matter. And what do you feel are the values, the vision, the responsibilities, and the role of the top 1% all inheritors that they presently play in the USA in comparison to other nations globally? And how do these differ between the patriarchal generation and the next gen? And again, you're welcome to share examples from your own uh, family, professional or other experiences, if you wish, uh, regarding that. So why don't we start with you, um, uh, Sonny? Um, yeah, I think there is a huge opportunity here because there's so much, um, I think, wealth creation that's being done. And a lot of that is doing, being done at a technological level. The one thing I observed is... Um, a lot of American wealth these days are disproportionately self-made. If you look at the wealthiest Americans today, uh, they are first generation wealth, like the, of the likes of Elon Musk, uh, Jeffrey Bezos, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison. I mean, a lot of them are technology or finance. And I think because of that, uh, the mentality is increasingly um, going towards giving their wealth back to society. Um, and I think because of that, um, you see this kind of renaissance in attacking a lot of the world's problem in a more kind of innovative, different way. If you look at like thing, foundations like Robin Hood Foundation, you look at Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, you know, they're using these kind of like innovative VC models to try to, you know, fund different charities and to attack problems um, like one at a time where each one of these foundations have certain um you know, charities that they're, they're very focused on. And I think moving forward, that is the way to kind of, um, you know, let the private or let the foundations and personal wealth, you know, fix a lot of the world's problems um, rather than just expecting, um, you know, governments or whatsoever to, 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 um, to rectify. Um, so one of the things I see is a lot of innovative models that are coming up, especially from the U.S., Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sonny. And again, same question, Kyle. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think many global inheritors today, uh, they were raised with the notion that the world is really burning. Um, and there are quite a lot of factors and elements that are outside of their control when uh, trying to look for solutions. Um, and I think this is partly the reason why uh, the top 1% of inheritors, namely you know, millennials and Gen Zs, uh, share values and responsibilities that uh, somewhat differ when compared to the patriarchal uh, generation. So, you know, first, um, we had the U.S. government uh, kind of take us to this horrible war in, in uh, Iraq in 2003 and 2004. Uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009 uh, generally resulted in uh, people's lack of trust in financial institutions uh, because we were told you know, from day one that Morgan Stanley will never fail, uh, Bear Stearns will never fail. Uh, Merrill Lynch will never fail, and they all failed. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, um, between 2010 and 2020, uh, the U.S. government uh, ravaged the Midwest uh, of the country by approving uh, OxyContin to be sold in pharmaceuticals. Uh, and as many of us are <clears throat> probably aware, uh, OxyContin is made from the same poppy seeds as heroin. And the FDA approved for such prescriptions in the U.S., uh, leading to uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals you know, generating 12 billion profits before uh, declaring bankruptcy and, and Johnson Johnson paying a, a pretty big fine to the U.S. government. So um, from the perspective of people 
who were raised watching all of these issues unfold over the last 20 years or so, uh, where the government kind of told you that the, the FDA said this is legal and approved, when in actuality, it really uh, messed up your community, um, you know, robbed you of your homes and sent your sons and daughters to wars where many people died. Uh, there's no doubt that our ideologies will change. Um, so I, I think hence uh, the strong emphasis on building um, genuine relationships with really hands-on engagement with the organizations that they choose to support or invest. Uh, there's a strong preference to be uh, an integral part of achieving social impact, uh, naturally integrating philanthropy to many aspects of our lives and uh, being motivated to give with uh, trust primarily being placed as priority and sharing knowledge and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. And again, David, same question. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately with Russian tanks rolling across um, Ukraine's borders and you know, waging this war in Europe, uh, it certainly feels like we've stepped back more than a generation in the midst of the same, same struggles um, that our grandparents faced. Um, and I think it lays bare the idea that we've made a lot of progress. I don't know if we made as much progress as we, we really think we have. Um, um, and from our from patriarchal generation. Um, and looking beyond Russia and, and the war in Ukraine uh, for a minute, which of course is sort of an extraordinary thing to say at, um, at the moment, but I don't think that we actually have as many regional differences um, as we think, right? I think all of our attention should be focused on, of course, first and foremost, stopping um, Russia. But beyond that, um, our values, our vision, our responsibilities should be focused on climate change. Um, we all suffer from the effects of inequality globally. Uh, we, and because of that, we also, for you know, as we've seen in Ukraine, we've all suffered from this um, lack of dem democracy, democratic institutions, and, and peace. Right? I think those should be the priorities. Um, and we are interconnected. And you can see from examples in, in Syria um, how lack of it. Sorry, that was, somehow my Siri popped up. But you, you see in um, from Syria, from Syria, Syria lacked democratic institutions, which uh, led to a, a revolution which failed, which led to a migrant crisis in Europe. You see in Africa, climate, climate change is causing people to uh, leave the countryside, go into cities to migrate north, again, causing a kind of migration problem um, and a human trafficking problem in, in Europe. So we're very much inter interconnected. And I think that for me personally, and, um, it stems from uh, climate action it's to, and, and focus on climate change it stems and a lack of focus on climate change it stems from uh, inequalities globally and and I think it also stems from uh, a, a degrading in, in deficit in, in democracy and democracy and 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 public institutions mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much David and Bob yeah what are your views um, same question uh, the one percent of inheritors play in the US in comparison uh, to those globally and any differences between the patriarchal and the next gen yeah, there's a big paradox. Um, on the one hand, <clears throat> I think we are seeing with the next gen a notion, a more ecological notion, that the company and the family, the extended family particularly, have to play a much more subtle role in the ecology of business because increasingly you can't just go for shareholder value, shareholder superiority, etc. You have to factor in sustainability, the environmental impact on the one hand, social impact on the other, and the notion of stakeholders, all of which are, are vague but very important at the moment. And that's beginning to come online. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to everything that's just been said. But the paradox is, for me, that US corporate governance is an absolute basket case. I mean, it is just dreadful. Um, and uh, most of the rest of the world is, is abandoning the US in that area. And they're developing some really interesting things in other parts of the world about this developing ecological notion. Uh, so I've, I've finished this little uh, uh, rant on the um, E.O. Wilson, who died, died very sadly, uh, very recently, um, the social biologist who said, we've entered the 21st century, particularly talking about the US, we've entered the 21st century with uh, Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and we are now a danger to ourselves and others. 
<laughs> That's a, a very poetic and very profound way to put it and, and ponders a lot of thought, Bob. Um, I'm sure our audience will be, be uh, thinking of those, uh, those words uh, in much more detail. And, and leads, of course, into to the next uh, part of our question, um, which is uh, from your own unique perspectives and interests, as the trajectory of economies continue to digitally be transformed, globalized and regulated, what do you feel is the most appropriate direction forward the next generation in the USA and internationally should take when it comes to positive social impact, financial uh, st uh, stability, and the great wealth distribution, greater wealth distribution during this coming uh, transfer of wealth. Um, Sunny, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put that to you first. Yeah, I think there's so many different problems in the world today. And I think um, one of the things that we need to do is as individuals and, and people in, in, in situations where we could have that positive impact, it's important to try to attack each one, one at a time. Um, and obviously it's not the responsibility for everyone to fix everything. But I think when people, at least from my experience, um, I think that a lot of these problems, when you go through the different layers, they're quite complicated and it really requires you know, people that have networks, that have certain thorough ways of thinking, um, of coming up with thoughtful so solutions. And because of it, I think what's important for this generation is going to be, you know, finding the thing, you know, be it a person or a family, uh, a certain, you know, issue that they want to attack and trying to, you know, find the, the deep problems um, and, and, and the solutions that we can you know, attack, um, you know, for whatever it is, you know, say modern day slavery, attacking disease, poverty, education. Um, and I think only once you really go through the deep layers, can you really actually have thoughtful solutions um, where you could dedicate kind of your time or your life to those uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Sunny. Again, Kyle, um, your, your thoughts on that as well. Sure. Um, well, as a biased venture capitalist, um, I, I think identifying structural problems early and uh, reducing such inequities by building, utilizing, and leveraging cutting edge technology is probably one of the fastest ways we can drive social impact, uh, financial stability, and greater uh, wealth distribution during this coming transfer of wealth. Um, I'm under strict uh, NDAs with most of the stealth mode tech businesses I'm incubating, but maybe to shed some light on a project I'm uh, helping build from the ground up uh, as an example of how we're driving uh, social impact as next generational investors. Um, so we're, we're, um, we've been observing, for instance, this trend where uh, the American dream is becoming more and more out of reach for everyday Americans. Um, the idea of home ownership and property ownership in the country is becoming uh, more of a pipe dream. Uh, there's this significant gap uh, being created with the perfect storm of uh, rapidly rising home prices, uh, unprecedented levels of private equity ownership flooding into the markets, um, rising mortgage rates, uh, and a lack of uh, financial alternatives in the marketplace. And particularly for millennials and uh, immigrant working populations, uh, there's precedent, you know, student debt levels, large rent increases, inflation, which are all eating away at the opportunity to uh, really build significant savings towards down payments and both homes and, and commercial property ownership. Um, so fundamentally, we want to develop, uh, let's say, a pathway for thousands and, and eventually millions of Americans to own their homes. And uh, this is with the advent of uh, digital technologies, uh, embedded finance APIs and uh, machine learning uh, AI. And uh, I think uh, we now more than ever um, we have the ability to create this new layer of financial technologies that can uh, fundamentally alter the way in which uh, Americans see pathway towards building equity and retirement wealth and long-term success. So uh, I can't get into too much detail on how we're doing it, but if, if data science can identify and source uh, prospective home owners uh, who are unable to, for instance, qualify for a traditional mortgage due to poor credit, uh, lack of down payment savings, or and so forth, um, taking a variety of data sources to determine a pathway uh, to ownership scores could uh, help them qualify for mortgage using uh, a broad range of tools available today, including FICO, uh, but also uh, employment history, bank statements, assets, 
other items, um, where later uh, we can pair with a mobile app, for instance, and allow them to track their progress to ownership. All in all, say um, there are many directions moving forward for the next generation globally to uh, positively generate social impact and uh, greater distribution of wealth through technology. Yeah, thank you very much, Kyle. And again, uh, David, uh, same question. I mean, what do you feel is the most um, appropriate direction forward um, the next generation in the USA and internationally should take? Yeah, I think given personally, given the challenges we, we face, it's almost morally irresponsible um, to start a business without a strong um, social and particularly environmental mission or for family offices to sort of sit on the sidelines and not step into the arena on social issues. Um, and fortunately, technology makes that so much easier. Um, technology does allow us um, the opportunity to um, really tackle some of these, these major crises we're facing. Um, but it's also a bit of a double dead short. Uh, it also, I think, it allows it, technology also allows us to feel like um, perhaps we're feel like we're doing more good than maybe we actually we are. Um, you know, in terms of distribution of, of wealth, I was just uh, earlier reading um, a, a study published by, by Gemini, the uh, cryptocurrency exchange, which uh, released a report. They found that the average crypto owner is 38 years old, uh, white male, making about $112,000 a year. 74% um, of the crypto holders are, are men, 71% are white. So this idea that it is um, this great savior of a new, you know, next gen driven decentralized currency that was supposed to sort of break down financial barriers and open new markets and, and be more inclusive has, hasn't lived up to sort of that billing. Um, so it's incumbent on um, especially sort of the, the thing office community um, and inheritors in our generation sort of make sure that we dig a little deeper um, and, and make sure that the technologies that we are putting forward, the technologies that we believe in that will change the world are actually doing just that. Um, and that we don't get swept up in this, this belief um, and notion that somehow um, because it's packaged differently, presented differently, um, that it will have different outcomes. Um, I think there's a, a massive opportunity here um, but it will take uh, our generation to be a little bit more thorough in their dil in our diligence and a little bit more intentional uh, and just to, to make sure that we continually are refining um, what these technologies are to ensure that they are achieving the outcome that, that we intend or we hope for when, when, when they were created. Yeah, thank you, Bob. And, yeah, and, and, and elaborating with more of a governance perspective, Bob, uh, what is the role that governance can play uh, regarding these key issues? And uh, what are some of the differences between the USA uh, and globally that you've uh, observed? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think generally there's uh, particularly now a focus on, especially in the families, on what are our values, the, the deep values, the things that Sunny mentioned very early on. And I would say the debate is around three types of value. One, the value of accountability, to whom and why. And also, um, then the second one is about probity, honest dealing. What does honest dealing actually mean in this future? Um, and the third is transparency. Um, and uh, how, considering that a lot of family offices and a lot of family businesses are seen as quite secretive, it's fascinating to watch during this ghastly um, Ukrainian war that's just running out, the way transparency through technology is playing such an amazing role in, and the US actually has led in this area in, in being very open about their briefings, but now people on the ground, individuals on the ground, actually giving out true, true information and uh, stalling armies and doing all sorts of things. So that the notion of accountability, probity and transparency what does that mean for our family? What does that mean for our future investments? Is part of it. But to me, that leads, and this is where the US has not been um, uh, in the forefront, to the growing notion of, gee whiz, did you realize there was something in, um, above being the executive? It's actually called being a director. And directors actually are meant to give governance using accountability, probity, and transparency to their organizations. And what's coming out of that in the most extraordinary parts of the world 
is the notion that directors need to be professionals. There needs to be a level of professionalism about what that job is. And, and, and therefore, we need to develop, and it is developing in most unlikely places, like the six countries of the uh, Arabian Gulf, the, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the um, nine countries of the Caribbean who are in dead trouble now realize that unless they can demonstrate professionalism through showing care, skill, and diligence in what they do, they haven't got a future, either as companies or countries. And this is a very interesting transition period where, again, I would argue very strongly that the next generation are taking this a lot more seriously than their fathers and mothers. Yeah. No, thank you, Bob. That's a very good point. And, and we've studied uh, um, profoundly uh, a lot of what's happening in the Caribbean and uh, the situation there um, and what's galvanizing them to action. Um, but a, a key point, and we'll keep these the next part really, very short and sharp if possible, You know, limited each answer to a minute if possible. Uh, are there any misconceptions, trends or key points that you feel are important to share with the audience that they may not be aware of? regarding the next generation uh, and the great wealth transfer in USA and globally. Why don't I start with you, David, because you, you've got the, the privileged position of observing thousands and thousands of members. You understand sort of trends and correlations and have access to some great sort of statistics and data. So what, what do you feel is missing from the conversation, misconceptions, trends or key points regarding this wealth transfer, David? Yeah, um, I, I think that... Um, one of the, the misconceptions is, is that everybody puts hope in the next generation always, and I think sometimes that it's maybe not misguided, but it it puts a lot of um, uh, pressure on on this our younger generation and absolves sort of the older generation from um, also sort of actively or other generations for actively um, working in concert uh, collectively to solve um, these big issues. I I also um, you know it, it's fascinating how much um, the idea of impact investing has become just not only um, a part of, of this wealth transfer, but it kind of seems to be now everything is centered around it, right? Um, 10 years ago, that term didn't exist. Um, and philanthropy was that it was much more traditional in what, in what people were funding in the art, towards arts and towards um, social and community and local programming. Um, and now uh, everyone is uh, launching a fund uh, and in venture, um, and it's you can see it from our our members in our, our community. Um, I think a lot of money is being directed that way. Um, sometimes at, at the cost of, of philanthropic dollars, um, but everyone seems to be kind of jumping into this and put it down mainstream. But trend, which is actually in some ways is is there are present challenges, but it's also it's great and in a lot of ways as well. And in particular, the overwhelming amount of, of, of money being invested is in climate. And I think that's where uh, I'm very hopeful. Uh, and that's where I think there is a lot of promise. Um, and you're seeing, um, you know, in, in our network at Nexus, uh, we, uh, are, we have 6,000 members that represent uh, about a trillion dollars in family net worth. Um, and um, you're just seeing an incredible amount of, of capital poured into um, clean tech, um, and, 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 and also fintech um, it are, seem to be the two biggest buckets mm -hmm. and where people are, are really engaging and investing both their, their time, energy, and money. Mm -hmm. no, thank you, David. Again, uh, Kyle, uh, same questions, uh, in, limited to one minute. So any misconceptions, trends, or key points you'd like to share that have caught your attention? Sure. Uh, I think traditionally, uh, my perception on cryptocurrencies was very negative. Uh, my misconception was that cryptos are usually uh, usually always pump and dump schemes that don't add any value to society. Um, but if I share one insight from a recent phenomenon that we're all uh, we've all been following, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so Russia's two largest exports are oil and wheat, and there are now millions of businesses that cannot trade these commodities. Um, what if there was a crypto commodities exchange? Uh, where business owners could effectively use crypto to purchase futures, contracts, and communities uh, like crude oil, metal, soybean, other agricultural products. I mean, especially if uh, the primary use for mid-tier commodities and in institutions in emerging markets uh, is to trade and hedge their risks uh, using crypto. So 
if you're a Colombian soybean farmer, you can hedge against your Colombian home currency by effectively selling uh, your soybean contracts into Bitcoin or Ethereum. Vice versa, if you're an oil manufacturer in uh, Turkey, uh, the Turkish lira is more volatile than Bitcoin. And uh, you can effectively um, hedge your currency risk by trading on this platform uh, if it exists. And if you're a Bitcoin miner in Iceland or Oklahoma or Kazakhstan, I mean, your biggest expense of electricity, right, or energy. So uh, imagine if you could have hedged against the increasing gas prices uh, from geopolitical black swans by buying or shorting futures on WTI crude uh, mm-hmm. with Bitcoin without necessarily having to go on separate exchanges. All in all to say, um, there could be tremendous value that we have yet to unlock and uncover by utilizing uh, decentralized financial protocols. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Carl. Again, Sunny, uh, same question. Are there any misconceptions, trends, or key points you feel are important to share? Yeah, I don't know how much misconception there is because it is kind of a secret uh, world. But, I mean, if there's any perception that, you know, in this huge wealth transfer that there's not a charity focus. I do think it is quite an exciting time. You know, like I mentioned before, foundations like Melinda Bill Gates Foundation, Robin and Foundation is doing great things in New York City. Um, you know, they're really testing these new models with technology, with this kind of carrot on a stick VC style funding. Um, and they're really innovating. But if you just look at, you know, obviously we've, I think everyone's kind of brought this up, but if you look at the Ukraine invasion today, you can see a lot of this stuff happening real time. And if you look at how Ukraine is using live updates um, to, you know, integrally uh, part of their, you know, tactic to inform the world on what's going on. You know, um, I think a couple of days ago, the Ukraine government asked if people could donate crypto. I think within a 12 hour span, there was uh, $15 million already fundraised. I don't know what the latest is, but that's in the first 12 hours. So I think there are all these new models being tested around the world. And especially with crypto and blockchain technology, a lot of these borders are being broken down. And I I think um, in that sense, I would encourage everyone to find new ways and and to make a difference by using these different types of technologies to really just break down the borders and, 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 you know, affect change. Mm-hmm, certainly. And, uh, and, and David, I'll put this one to you specifically, um, just in the interest of time. Are there any key lessons you've learned from your experience or another's family dynamics you feel is what positive collaboration and change amongst the family? Um, if you've got um, you know, one minute for that one. Yeah, I, I think that um, I, we've seen a lot of uh, family members, I can actually test this personally as, as well, who... Um, are um, wanting to to um, create a better world um, that might be actually at odds with the, the the source of wealth or the legacy of the family, right? And so uh, you think of tradition like oil and gas um, or coal, or any, and, and, and the next generation is stepping up to say that um, uh, you know we want to move the the family. Um, you know, office or foundation away from those towards, you know, clean uh, technologies and renewables. Um, and we've seen a lot of these conversations taking place. Um, and we've seen sort of a um, interesting dynamic where at first um, they were off, these kind of next gen were often dismissed. But as um, more evidence comes out as to the urge of climate and as they find sort of their voice and sort of are able to um, not just make the uh, environmental argument, but also make the economic argument that um, we've seen the next gen lead great, you know, the entire transitions uh, of their families, you know, family office and investment strategy towards a, a, a new um, technology that is divergent from what the, the, the legacy family business was. Uh, and that's a quite um, significant shift. And I think quite also inspiring uh, in that um, by, by sort of, um, creating a new roadmap, we can actually move away from some of these these older legacy, more complicated legacy, um, you know, family histories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you, David. And again, uh, Carl, you know, sort of short and sharp on this one, uh, roughly a minute. Uh, what role does entrepreneurship, technology, social impact, philanthropy, creatively, and a global outlook play in the lives of the next gen you've come across, Kyle? Because you've lived a very global life yourself. Uh, and are next gens encouraged and given the freedom to explore these by the patriarchal generation? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when, when Edison created the phone or uh, when Oppenheimer harnessed uh, nuclear fission 
um, it was all for the same reason, right? To move at a greater velocity towards a better future. So uh, tech entrepreneurs, I think, really connect the dots between how information flow works uh, more recently. And because as technology evolves, information evolves. So there's a huge benefit to building uh, creative machines from scratch uh, to impact uh, a million lives. So uh, to give an example, um, you know, if we identify some of the largest, most successful firms that came in and disrupted existing legacies today, uh, think of Netflix and uh, Tesla, for instance, uh, they both entered highly, highly competitive markets. Uh, Tesla had dozens of manufacturers. Uh, the Toyota Prius was out in the mid 1990s and sold thousands of their models. Um, but what Tesla didn't have um, was the burden of the legacy product. So uh, when Toyota had combustion engines, for instance, um, uh, that had to make small incremental changes, um, all these new guys like Tesla started from zero. So they leapfrogged everybody. Same thing for Netflix. Uh, most people were going through blockbusters or ordering movies through mail. Uh, Netflix jumped mm -hmm. right through it. So I think it all plays, technology really does play into the lives of uh, next generational explorers. No, yeah, thank you very much for that, Carl. And again, Bob, just building on that, what context does governance presently play in the furtherment of these uh, and what requires additional consideration and implementation going into the future in roughly one minute, Bob? Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, I feel that we're just starting to see a, a truly major shift in, in corporate governance. Um, I'm just publishing a book saying four, le four levels of maturity in boards. First level is that 90 plus percent of people around the world who are on boards don't understand what it means, don't particularly care, like the um, uh, status, and that's about it. Thanks, folks. Um, mm -hmm. About 10 percent of really, no, sorry, about 5 percent are really grumpy and realize that the uh, legislation is really tightening and uh, they don't like it and they uh, resent the fact that they now have to comply in certain ways. Perhaps 3% actually develop what's called a learning board, which is saying the future is about the way we balance these ecological models, including environmental and social and financial and entrepreneurial impact. And that's a real intellectual and, and uh, moral challenge for everybody. And about 1% are saying, and to do that, we've got to be professional. So there's a lot of new pressure just beginning to build. A lot of it is coming from the next generation. But at the moment, people are still playing arbitrage games, particularly in the US, where states are arbitraging against each other to go for the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Now, thank you, Bob. And again, we're going to wind this now to a, to a close, gentlemen. So uh, in 30 seconds, and please limit it to 30 seconds, as a special gift and insight for our audience here at Harassus, if you had to pick one or maximum two key insights uh, you feel are most important about either the patriarchal generation or the next generation's perspective, focus, mindset, and role in the Great Wealth Transfer, what would that be and why? Uh, Sonny? 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, I think one thing is when you talk about family wealth, I think it's imperative to have an honest conversation on where each one of the stakeholders or family members, what their wishes are, what their risk profiles are, what their lifestyles are. And it's okay to go on different directions. You know, some may be really passionate about philanthropic endeavors. Some want to continue, you know, to generate wealth for the family. Um, but it's okay. But it's, it's important to have that honest conversation. Yeah. Kyle, again, 30 seconds. Your final insight. Yeah, I think, you know, we're definitely seeing a rise of, uh, a, 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 I guess, crowdfunding, for instance, and raising capital online uh, is one of the biggest trends that we're seeing in the next generational kind of private market space. Uh, there's definitely more of a syndication where different families, different investors, institutional or not, uh, get together to really push an idea together and, and, and pursue the same values. So mm. I think that's definitely something we should uh, keep in mind of as we look to markets uh, and their different industries in the next 10 years. Yeah, thank you. And David, yeah, your final insight in, uh, in 30 seconds. Yeah, I would just say that I think that, that for all the challenges, there is uh, still an incredible amount of optimism that we will be able to figure this out, that we will be able to use harness technology um, to um, basically, you know, uh, in some sense, sense to save the world. Um, but I also think that there's a, a growing awareness that the the issues of, of climate 
the inequality and um, you know democratic institutions are all very intricately linked and that um, they must always sort of tackle um, together as one um, and I think that um, that is a, an insight that I think that our generation is starting to, to wake up to and understand and and uh, really um, join in that kind of the the fight to, to do that. Yeah, thank you. And Bob, your final words uh, on governance and the great wealth transfer, that last insight. Okay. Um, yeah, I that people, particularly families, invest time and money, m- more time and money in their board development so that we develop learning boards, continuously learning boards with a conscience. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for those valuable insights. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure you're uh, you're very intrigued uh, to to pursue these uh, thoughts even further. Uh, So please feel welcome to reach out to any one of our panelists uh, or the harass community directly. Uh, In particular, thanks to uh, uh, Frank Jürgen Richter, who's kindly made this entire conference and this extraordinary community of global leaders uh, possible. Um, This concludes our great generational wealth transfer uh, panel. Um, I'd like to thank every one of my panelists for uh, attending and their extraordinary insights. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I wish you great success, prosperity uh, and safety in these uh, very uncertain times and a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.